Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, from Anantara Golden Triangle here in far north Thailand. Um, welcome to this week's elephant professional lecture. I'm sitting here overlooking. Today I can see elephants grazing in the grassland in their friendship group, so I'm, I'm in a happy place. I hope you are all in your own happy places as well. This morning's, this week's elephant professional lecture is from Dr. Ingrid Suta, who did her PhD um, a few years ago, I was going to say many years ago, but you're not that old, are you, Ingrid? A few years ago um, in, the, uh, in Laos on captive elephants and elephants in tourism in Laos, um, just as that country was opening up to elephant tourism um, and then has gone on to do many great things. Currently, I think, teaching at yeah, university in Australia. Um, one thing the eagle eyed of, among you will have noticed is that she's um, perhaps to uh, perhaps to stir me up a little bit, but the two, two were in the title of her talk. <laughs> two words that I often often uh, mention should be very only used carefully together in the same sentence, and that's conservation and captive elephants. Um, but I'd say that from Thailand, where we have a lot of captive elephants and they don't need conserving, and in Laos, um, and in Laos they do. So um, this is I, I don't mention it because I want to argue with Ingrid because she knows what she's talking about. But I know a lot of you out there have heard me say it many times and will be surprised to be see me introducing a talk with those two words in there. So Ingrid will tell us why they should go together, why it matters in Laos, um, particularly in this current situation where elephants can't be moved across borders legally. Um, and perhaps you will argue that sometimes, as we did last week, that sometimes it might be a good idea under very strict circumstances for elephants to move across borders. Um, captive elephants, wild elephants, of course, should travel as freely as they like. Um, so anyway, without further ado, and hopefully not having wound up Ingrid <laughs> with, with my, uh, with my uh, escape clause, I will hand you over to Ingrid and she will tell you why it is very important to conserve the captive elephants of Laos. So thank you very much, Ingrid. Please do uh, let us know who you are and um, convince us. Thanks, John. And I'm glad that you pointed that out. I, I thought somebody would bring it up. I didn't realize they would bring it up straight away in the first 60 seconds. Sorry. But I'm hoping today that I will demonstrate why I do firmly believe that in many countries, not just Laos, we're looking at Cambodia, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, even, you know, Borneo, Malaysia, why having these, these really um, small yet significant captive populations can actually do uh, a world of good for the country and for the Asian elephant uh, population as whole. So I'll get stuck into it. I'll share my screen now with you all. Can you see all of that? I can, yes. You can? Okay, I'm hoping everyone else out there can as well. So yes, thank you very much for joining me today. My name is Dr. Ingrid Suter. Um, I'm currently one of the co-owners of Asian Captive Elephant Standards. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Um, but yes, I do have a few years of working with uh, captive Asian elephants, particularly in the Lao PDR. So today I'm just gonna do a bit of a trip down memory lane, uh, have a look in the past and some of the issues that concerned captive elephants in Laos, a little bit of my PhD research uh, and how it all led to where we are today with uh, Asian captive elephant standards and elephant-based tourism. There's a bit of an overarching theme to everything that I'm gonna be talking about uh, today as well, which is really the needs for grassroots consultation and a bottoms up approach to in-situ captive elephant management, be it for conservation or tourism purposes or a mixture of both. And I really wanna to demonstrate to everyone today why respectful communication and acknowledging and working within the local parameters is a really critical and necessary step uh, to creating any kind of meaningful exchange and progress in this, um, in this sector. So I'll go back to 2000, hang on, let me change that there. I'll go back to 2008 and 2011, when I was uh, an AusAid Australian Youth Ambassador for Development and the Australian government essentially paid me to work with captive elephants in Laos. It was a pretty cool gig. Um, I think it's really important that people who haven't maybe worked in Laos Get a bit of an understanding about the institutional structure that international non-government organizations in Laos have to work under. 
as this 100% impacts the work and the research that can be done, the speed in which projects are implemented and the outcomes that can be delivered, and the formal process that's involved with working in Laos for an international non-government organisation. Up until recently, there hasn't been any civil society or local NGOs allowed in Laos. They had to be international NGOs only. All INGOs operating in Laos face stringent supervision and monitoring. Regulations are applied in a yearly memorandum of understanding, which must stipulate in detail uh, where the INGO is permitted to work, the annual budget in which province each dollar is going to be spent, and detailed activity reports on each project. The Government of Laos has the authority to reject or make changes to each MOU as it deems necessary. Uh, INGOs must have government counterparts that they work closely with, and in Elephant Asia's case, it was staff from the Department of Livestock and Fisheries, because as you know, captive elephants are considered livestock in many range nations. These staff will accompany you on field missions and will act as the intermediary between INGO and Government of Laos departments. Um, I just wanted to really set the scene as I think some foreigners think you can just stroll into a camp or an organisation or the country and expect and demand change. Uh, anything that is done can easily take up to a year to be pre-approved and that's okay, accepting this and working within the parameters, having a really good relationship with the government staff will achieve much better results as opposed to fighting or demanding change from the periphery with no commitment to a long-term plan. And that all still applies today. Uh, I also want to point out a bit of a socioeconomic snapshot of what the Lao PDR is like. Again, maybe for those who haven't really um, been or, or don't necessarily grasp the big picture, um, I just think it's really important to understand the economic, political, social and biophysical characteristics of the country in order to understand the complexities of Lao elephant management. Uh, for the past 40 years, Laos has been a single party communist state with approximately 73% of the nation's 6 million people living on around two US, two US dollars a day. Uh, approximately 75% of people live in non-urbanized areas, although more, more and more people are moving to urban areas these days. Laos remains an agrarian society with most Lao nationals directly reliant on natural resources such as shifting agriculture, fisheries and non-timber forest products for their dietary and livelihood requirements. And in this instance, we're talking about hundreds of families directly reliant on elephant utilization in a country where alternative jobs in rural areas are really scarce. Um, this bottom picture is here is just one I took in Southern Laos uh, five years ago um, when I was working in this area with the IUCN. This, it was the end of the dry season here and this bit of water was the, um, the local water supply for the village, the village people and the livestock as well. This is a country where primary healthcare targets are still not met. There are issues with clean drinking water. And when I lived in Vientiane, people only an hour out of the capital would be dying of typhoid and other waterborne diseases annually during the flooding and the wet seasons. I'm not trying to be negative. Uh, I'm just pointing out the challenges and barriers that exist that we in the West um, sometimes have absolutely no lived experience of. The vast majority of captive elephants in Laos are privately owned. Traditionally, one elephant would be owned by an entire family or a, a set of families, and men would take turns working each year with the elephant, or maybe the man wouldn't work with the elephant at all, but his cousin would take his place and they'd split the profits or, or whatever. But elephant ownership has always been an accepted normal part of the culture and rural life in Laos. Just, uh, just as people in the outback of Australia will probably own a couple of horses, it's normal for families in Sayaburi to own an elephant or two. And in my entire time living and working in Laos, not once was there a debate about whether or not elephants should be kept. It was simply a norm. Uh, just as I don't have conversations in Australia about whether or not uh, Australian farmers should have working horses, it's just completely acceptable. 
Although, of course, now taking elephants from the wild has been illegal for a long time, um, which has caused the captive elephant population to be ageing. I'll get into that in a, in a bit. Uh, but back to Elephant Asia. Elephant Asia was a um, French-run international non-government organization founded by Sebastien Dufio and Gilles Moray. Uh, I had the pleasure of watching and learning these guys perform so much great elephant work and all on the smell of an oily rag. Uh, Sebastien, of course, is now co-owner of the Lao Elephant Conservation Center and Gilles completed a PhD also on Lao elephants uh, and is working back at the University of Montpellier and is involved in uh, elephant work mainly now in Myanmar, I believe. Elephant Asia began working in Laos in 2001 and remained active until around 2011 when most of their programs were formally handed over to the Department of Livestock and Fisheries for their complete project implementation and autonomy. Elephant Asia at this time was the only NGO working in Laos to assist captive elephant populations. Wild elephant populations were assisted by WWF and WCS, mainly protected area surveying, uh, population census, human elephant conflict and things like that. Elephant Asia performed a ton of really great work under the Lao Elephant Care and Management Program. Um, too many programs to talk about, but some of the main ones were their socioeconomic stability for Mahouts. So the top left photo here was the first ever Mahout Association in Laos, seeing how logging Mahouts can change and work into tourism and how they can structure that. Uh, down below here, Elephant Asia had a baby bonus program. Essentially, they would supply Mahouts with these pieces of agricultural equipment that they could use to make money um, instead of uh, working their elephants and logging and they could take some time off to to breed their elephant and essentially have their elephant on maternity leave. Elephant Asia also did a ton of environmental education and environmental awareness in the country. Uh, the largest of this was the annual elephant festivals held in dif different districts around the Savory province. These festivals would basically be a week long celebration and they would bring in over 100,000 US dollars to that district every year, which was a really great injection of cash. Uh, they also did a ton of environmental um, education for local Lao children and they would publish books and posters in the local Lao language and distribute these to hundreds, if not thousands of villages around the country. Uh, the major work that Elephant Asia performed, though, was their mobile veterinary unit. Uh, this is the, the little car here that would mainly go out in the dry season, but would sometimes go out in the wet season as necessary. Most elephants at this point were working in really remote parts of Laos, typically involved in selective logging for rosewood and other valuable timber species. Mahouts would spend months away from their families at a time while camping in the mountainous regions of Pieng, Hongsa and other gorgeous areas of Laos. This mobile veterinary unit, by the way, uh, is the only one in the entire country. So here they ha you have a picture of Tongsavat down the bottom uh, here cleaning up a, a wound. Uh, Elephant Asia was also successful in implementing the only national elephant registration and microchip database. So up until this point, uh, registration of elephants was very localized. It was done on a provincial or even a district level. Whereas Elephant Asia centralized the, the whole registration for the country and they also microchipped um, all of the captive elephants in country as well. And here's a picture of Vatsana, the most incredible uh, vet technician in the entire country of Laos, um, microchipping an elephant. They also did a lot of education for Mahouts on how to provide first aid for their elephants too. Uh, the reason I'm going on about Elephant Asia so much is because the work that they undertook with Mahouts is something really unique and outstanding. And I think many people and many organisations can learn so much from their practices. It really was a perfect example of a bottoms up approach to successful conservation and community development. 
And an example of this would be while well, treating a logging elephant, this would often be just on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere. These mobile vet unit trips were really a lesson in trust, communication and respect from every angle. So Elephant Asia had no authority over the elephant or the mahout. As pre-arranged by the local government counterpart, the mahout's knew Elephant Asia were coming, but it was the mahout's decision whether or not to bring their elephant for a medical check or not. They didn't have to come. They could have kept working in the forest, simply forgotten what time you would be there or just be incommunicado. They certainly weren't paid to come and see Elephant Asia. So why did these men keep coming back with their elephants to see the Elephant Asia staff? It was because they knew that they would not be judged or chastised or treated poorly by the Elephant Asia staff. And because they loved their elephants and they wanted to talk about their elephants and they wanted to get help for their elephants. If an elephant had an abscess, Elephant Asia vets would clean it up and they would say, we recommend you don't work your elephant uh, for a few weeks until this wound is healed. Um, but the mahout didn't have to, to listen to us. Yelling or abusing or disrespecting the mahout for having an injured elephant would have seen the mahout never come back and the elephant would have been lost to our records for good. So what is the good of that? This is why I always champion the benefits of harm minimization and appropriate communication when liaising with elephant owners. Whether we agreed with logging or not was irrelevant. We were a fish out of water in their world. And I think a lot of people need to remember that uh, in the discourse. By this stage, I'd been living in Laos for three years. My time at Elephant Asia was coming to an end. Um, but there was just so much more work that needed to be done. So I decided to do a PhD on uh, captive elephants. Uh, at, by this stage, it was clear that Laos was running out of valuable timber species and logging elephants were running out of work. More and more elephant tourist camps were opening up in Luwampabang and elephant tourism was currently not keeping up with demand. So I went back to Australia and I did a PhD focusing on mahout attitudes and population viability analysis of Lao elephants and a little bit of a tourism analysis as well. I really wanted to document what mahouts were thinking and saying about, their, about working with elephants and the challenges that they were experiencing. They are, after all, responsible for the day-to-day -day lives and therefore the conservation of Asian elephants. They are the decision makers, not any NGO or tourism organization, but the mahouts that own the elephants. So for my first paper, I spent 10 months interviewing 133 mahouts around four different provinces of Laos. Uh, it took forever. <laughs> um, I did my data analysis. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the paper because there's so much in it. Um, there's the, um, the reference for the paper down there. I'm also happy to, email you a copy of it if that's what you like, no problem. But essentially the majority of surveys took place in the Sabery province, which makes sense because that's where the majority of captive elephants are from. I used ANOVA and chi-square analysis to identify the areas of significance in Mahout attitudes towards their work. Mahouts working in the Sabery province believed they had no other choice for a job or income other than working with the family elephant. Conversely, mahouts and tourism chose to work with elephants rather than having the family tradition forced upon them. With Luang Prabang, one of the busiest and most accessible cities in Laos, these mahouts had greater access to a variety of employment options, particularly in tourism, whereas the remoteness of Sayaburi means a selection of employment opportunities is really rare. The Mahout tradition is losing its appeal to younger generations from traditional Mahout families. A lack of assistance or interest in Mahoutship by adolescents was confirmed. While elder Mahouts wanted their tradition continued, realistically they knew Mahoutship was not their son or relative's aspiration. This leaves the Mahout tradition and culture with an uncertain future in Laos. Mahouts working in tourism expressed a strong desire to learn more about the elephants they worked with. And this is an indication of their inexperience and insufficient on the job training. My findings suggested that logging mahouts are very willing to work in the tourism industry. 
However, a transition into tourism may be unachievable for most logging mahouts if tourist camps prefer to employ young, inexperienced mahouts willing to work for significantly lower wages, and if the industry maintains its preference for cows over bulls, which I'm sure it will. Older mahouts can be an added service to the tourism industry by mentoring and training young, non-traditional mahouts. However, elephant camps may be unwilling to financially invest in this arrangement. Mahouts working in tourism are the lowest earners compared with all other uh, elephant related industries. Tourism mahouts are the youngest of all elephant based professions, have no mahout background or alternative source of income. Hired by tourist camp managers or elephant owners, these young men are vulnerable to job and financial insecurity if the tourism industry experiences a downturn, which of course it has. Um, and I think the youngest tourism mahout that I interviewed was 13 years old, working full time at a camp. Uh, conversely, logging mahouts can earn over eight times the national per capita income. Despite this, the wealthiest mahouts experienced the highest levels of job dissatisfaction, mainly due to the decline in logging quotas and the hard living conditions associated with logging. Now, just a quick look at population viability analysis. I was really excited to be able to do this modeling as thanks to Elephant Asia's national registration database, I had a really good data set to populate the Vortex uh, software with. Vortex is a modeling tool commonly used by researchers involved in captive breeding and by conservation managers to gauge minimal population viability or extinction rates for populations at risk. PVA modeling is typically integrated into conservation planning as the program accepts assumptive parameters and environmental variations and allows for adaptive species management. In this case, I was really fortunate to have the age, the sex and the location of all captive elephants registered in Laos. This is a massive point of difference from wild population analysis in which conservation planners have to simply guess the age and the structure, uh, the gender structure of each population. Guesswork, of course, will not lead to targeted and accurate results as much as knowing specific baseline parameters will. And this is why another reason why I firmly believe that the captive elephant population can be so critical for endangered species management, because we know exactly what it is we're dealing with. Whereas wild population structures are completely unknown, unless a great deal of accurate and very expensive surveying has occurred, and it relies on too many externalities to be considered the only conservation tool that planners should rely on. Um, again, I'm not gonna go into too much technical detail here as it is all in the paper. Uh, I created seven different scenarios with varying parameters. The population was considered a single closed population with no migration rather than several small populations scattered throughout Laos. I considered this to be realistic as mahouts routinely buy, sell, rent or move elephants between provinces as economic drivers demand. Immigration was not included as illegally exported calves would typically be unknown to elephant Asia and not contained within the data set. Initial population size was 431 of which 253 were cows and 178 were bulls. This figure includes only calves and elephants of reproductive age. Maximum age of reproduction for cows and bulls was 55. We chose an even sex ratio at birth. And while Lama Hoots believe slightly more males are conceived, male calves tended to have a higher perinatal and juvenile mortality rate. Juvenile bull behavior and higher risk taking typically uh, leads to a higher mortality rate in the sex as well. Percentage of breeding females was calculated by analysing the, the previous four years of captive elephant births recorded in the database. Uh, this is considered the most accurate Lao captive elephant data ever recorded, and it was uh, necessary to use actual representative values rather than breeding estimates from other elephant studies. The average percentage of breeding females was really low, only 2.3%, but we consider this an accurate portrayal of the current Lao context. Percentages of males in the breeding pool was 80% as social hierarchy dictates that not all bulls have the opportunity to reproduce. 
However, as most calves in Laos are sired by wild bulls, the fertility of captive bulls remains unknown as far as I'm aware. We didn't include any harvesting in any scenario, uh, nor did we include any wild elephant demographics. Uh, with wild elephant populations poorly monitored and managed in Laos, I focused solely on the population with the accurate data. To cut a long story short, all the simulations indicated that Laos captive elephant population is not self-sustaining, shock horror. Uh, the captive, <laughs> current captive population had a negative growth rate in that mortality rates are higher than the reproductive rate. The baseline population showed that the captive elephant population is likely to become extinct in 112 years. In no scenario was the carrying capacity reached. Reducing mortality, increasing birth rates and population supplementation reduced the rate at which the population reached extinction, but did not stop it. Scenario seven provided the Lao captive elephant population with the longest persistence, but even then the model predicted extinction within 220 years. So looking back at scenario seven here, the best case scenario, it was 10% higher fecundity, 50% lower mortality and 10 supplemented calves. Of course, the, the major barrier to conservation at that stage and still today is a lack of national and regional cooperation and funding to invest in endangered species management. This is why I am a really strong advocate for treating the captive elephant population as a core elephant population that deserves effective management strategies in any range nation that is. Some people ask why have a elephant, captive elephant population? Well, again, having a population that we know the parameters about and that we can manage is in my opinion of equal importance to having a wild population that you know very little about. You can't manage a population accurately or successfully if you don't know what it is that you're trying to manage. So having done this study, it solidified my appreciation of captive elephant ownership and ensuring the mahouts in control of the elephants are given breeding opportunities so we can all benefit from these calves. And by breeding opportunities, I mean giving elephant owners alternative forms of income so they can take time off to breed their, cow, their cows. This is a real long-term approach to captive elephant population and all elephant population. I've done the work, I've seen the benefits of having a captive population. I know what needs to be done. We just need a really good funder for this. <laughs> um, now, just a little bit on tourism. And this point in my PhD, I'd ran out of time and money. Uh, so I didn't publish this chapter, but I wish I had. Um, it was clear that elephant-based tourism was on the rise in Laos. I really wanted to study the market. I did this by looking at the literature in Laos showcasing elephant tourism. And I also interviewed 20 prominent tour operators and camp managers in Laos for their opinion on elephant-based tourism. Are the claims made by camps leading to meaningful elephant conservation? What I saw during my research were these advertisements about Lao elephant camps, often making biocentric and socially altruistic claims such as saving elephants and rescuing elephants and helping the local community. Yet elephant populations continue to decline with seemingly little emphasis placed on elephant reproduction by businesses which essentially rely on elephant populations persisting over time. Despite the growing popularity of elephant-based tourism, not enough camps were actively committed to captive elephant reproduction. I know this is going to really annoy you, John. <laughs> While acknowledging the issues surrounding elephant conservation, most camps tended to view their businesses as anthropocentric, self-contained, closed industries, rather than complex ecotourism products fraught with future constraints. Some of these could be justified because of the current ease of acquiring captive elephants. With elephant-based tourism still very popular in Laos, the tourism industry does have the capacity to hire additional young cows, implement reproductive plans and help increase the elephant population. But perhaps short-sightedness is necessary for elephant camp managers with no financial or procedural support from the government. Camps have little motivation to invest in long-term conservation plans when they witness the government exporting elephants for their financial and political gain. 
The government of Laos' lack of environmental and conservation protection appeared too unpredictable to inspire business confidence or investment, thus preventing elephant camps from making long-term biocentric business decisions. Furthermore, elephant camps claim to have little control over the elephants they hire, they are unenthusiastic to breed elephants they don't own, and they see themselves losing money on pregnant cows and their dependent calves. Most elephant camps were satisfied at making as much money as possible from each tourist season, with emphasis placed on rescuing elephants from logging rather than being involved in any national breeding strategy or program. Not only were the biocentric behaviors overlooked, but most camps tended to strongly promote their social altruistic tendencies. Camps could gain tangible and immediate status by supporting local communities, rather than investing in the task of reversing the declining national elephant population. Indeed, poverty alleviation and local community empowerment in a least developed nation was often viewed as far more important than animal conservation or welfare. Certainly in this regard, camp managers were much more positive and responsive when describing the community work their camps undertook. Camps employed local villagers in roles such as farming, minibus drivers, cashiers, cooks, gardeners. Locals got paid taxes for the use of their land during elephant treks, and some camps came to agreements with local governments for land use rights, land use rights and farming. Many of these pro-poor benefits are widely advertised on the elephant camp brochures and websites, along with a rescued from a life of hardship elephant story. So that was that for the PhD. After the PhD, I went back to Laos to work for the IUCN as the uh, Biodiversity, Environmental and Communities Coordinator. We did a lot of endangered species work and climate change adaptation work. Uh, of this work, 99% of it consisted of community consultation because no matter how ambitious your project, you're not going to save a species if the communities living in the same area as the species are left out of the decision-making process. This is nothing new. Community consultation, grassroots development, and a bottoms-up approach to conservation planning has long been recognized as critical factors for endangered species management success. And I hope by this stage yeah, in the talk, you can see that I'm really passionate about the representation of local voices in the discourse surrounding endangered species management. It's not just a piecemeal activity, it's actually critical to a project's successful outcome. But now working, I'm now working in this elephant-based tourism and all of a sudden I've been thrust into a world where people making decisions about elephants aren't so much as consulting or genuinely engaging with the elephant owners or the elephant experts. And as I've just hopefully demonstrated, if you're not working with the mahout, then you're not working with the elephant. I've always seen a benefit of having a standardized system for elephant tourism. It just makes sense that the level of skills and welfare at camps are consistent, regardless of which camp you're at. My interactions with Mahouts genuinely show me that they love their elephants. And I know it's a really minute number of Mahouts that intentionally harm their elephants, and there is no place for these people in the sector. I also think it's really important to recognize the role of stakeholders in, in these different industries. So the main stakeholders for elephant managers may be the elephant owners, veterinarians, families, and camp managers. Whereas with huge international tourism organizations, they've got a really different stakeholder set. Key stakeholders in tourism are not necessarily people living in country, the major stakeholder group might be Westerners who have a very limited uh, understanding or knowledge of captive elephant ownership, management or veterinary care. But these people are really passionate about their elephants. So we are in this situation with elephant based tourism in which tourism organisations are trying to make long term decisions about elephants without including the elephant owners uh, in the conversation. As demonstrated in my talk, uh, a tops down approach will not have as great a success rate as a bottoms up approach to creating change. Remember, we're working in a country where basic services are in really short supply. 
So you can't really apply a London-based policy to a remote corner of a developing nation without any consultation or supplying any support or long-term assistance in doing so. And of course, you'd have to be living under a rock uh, if you haven't noticed the, the negative feedback that elephant tourism has received, you know, for a long time now, but uh, particularly in the last few years. And I acknowledge that there is a push away from having any human elephant contact at elephant camps. But the majority of this pressure comes from Western organisations who believe that touching or training an elephant automatically equates to animal cruelty. These organisations claim to love animals, but they're also very anti-science and anti-culture in their actions and beliefs. And that's not the philosophy of responsible travel. Uh, elephant stories are also great clickbait to the media. So the one bad egg story becomes the repetitive stereotype for all mahouts in all countries. Public safety and liability is a huge factor as to why some tourism organisations are distancing themselves from human elephant conflict, which is fine, but this has got nothing to do with elephant welfare and more to do with company reputation, and it's best not to confuse the two. And ultimately, the tourism industry isn't in the business of endangered species management. By definition, responsible travel is meant to respect local cultures and local traditions. Westerners tend to hold intrinsic values towards elephants and what an elephant should be. Whereas in elephant home ranges, they have a utilitarian worth and value as well as an intrinsic value. This is because of the 4,000 year old tradition of elephant ownership reflected even in today's legislative position as livestock. Captive elephant utilisation is not a crime. Elephant ownership should not be vilified by Western groups who think they need to solve the elephant problem because it doesn't align with Western values. For example, many Western organisations don't want mahouts to even hold a hook. Uh, Western groups and no hook camps need to stop pushing the message that is directly contributing to mahout deaths. Issues, of course, always come back to elephant welfare, which is absolutely fair enough. No one supports elephant cruelty of any kind. And thankfully, there is an incredible group of academics, uh, such as Dr. Im, who spoke on here a few weeks ago. These academics are working really hard to research captive elephant welfare, living conditions, management, stress levels, and so forth. More and more is being discovered about how to care for Asian elephants in captivity. Given the years of research and blood, sweat and tears that I went under to produce a PhD, uh, I'm aware of the absolute perfection that peer reviewed papers have to possess in order to be published. Literally every single sentence needs to be perfect, otherwise the paper is sent back repeatedly. Methodologies have to be replicable for future studies. So when academics publish papers saying elephants in captivity can live well and they can have low levels of stress and human elephant contact can be okay, then I respect the research and I make management recommendations based on this research. So I really struggle with not just individuals, but with entire organisations that have no conservation background, no elephant management uh, background or consultation and no respect for science and insist that every single elephant is kept in cruel conditions. It's simply not true. Captive elephants have worked in a large number of industries over time, logging, timber, small scale agricultural, uh, warfare, and now tourism. Of all the industry types, tourism is the most placid, the most gentle and reproductively compatible for elephants. In summary, let's look at the positives here that we can all work with rather than being stuck at some negative impasse. Captive elephants are compatible with captive breeding strategies. Tourism and conservation can work very well together. One is not the enemy of the other. We need to follow the science for excellent levels of elephant welfare and have elephant camps independently assessed for their welfare standards this also includes mahout care and for mahout standards, because if you're not looking after the mahout, if he's dissatisfied at his place of work, he's not gonna look after his elephant properly. That goes with any workplace, you've got to look after your staff. Which of course brings me on to Asian captive elephant standards. We are a team of three elephant and auditing professionals. 
ASIS aims to apply the highest level of elephant welfare standards possible to elephants living under human care. We assess and audit elephant camps with nearly 200 different criteria. I'm not going to talk too much about ACES and the criteria because my colleague Nicholas uh, has recently given a discussion on this subject on this forum not long ago. At ACES, we see ourselves as the link between elephant owners, elephant tourism and elephant research. There are so many good camps and good managers providing excellent welfare, target training and enrichment for their elephants. I shake my head every day when people say elephant tourism is not a good thing for elephants because under the right conditions, it can be. I understand that tour operators are in a really precarious position because they need to keep their Western clients happy. And yet elephant tourism is such a popular attraction in Southeast Asia. What I say to them is to please read the science for yourself. Do your research, you don't have to take my word for it educate yourself and then come and talk to us at Asian Captive Elephant Standards. And, and I recommend you team up with your preferred elephant camp and make sure that they too follow the most recent um, advances in academia and their findings on captive elephant management. Thank you, I'm done. Cheers. Try me, that was sudden, sorry, uh, I, I was listening. <laughs> I just wasn't expecting you to finish quite so quickly. Thank you very much, Ingrid. Um, and certainly not annoyed at all. Um, I think you made your point very well. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's a it is a very valid point as to why we would why we would need a, a at least one population of elephants that we uh, we know everything about just in case the other population disappears. So I I understand it well. Uh, yeah. We won't go any further into that. Um, thank you very much also for pointing out the difference between peer review and. Um, basically blogs or self self published things yeah, opinion yeah. pieces um anyone can this is this is a, it's a it's to me the key point actually a lot of people can anyone can go and write something that they think is true and myself included i'm not a scientist uh but i do know about peer review and i do know as you say every single sentence has to be there so the science peer reviewed science must be respected more than opinion pieces um yeah. and, uh, and and emotions and emotions yeah, exactly. Um, and this emotion, this is a very highly emotive, and I understand it. I think at the end of the day, everybody has the same goal and the same vision, and that is to make sure no elephants are being um, forced to do anything or, or, or being stressed or living in fear or living in cruelty. I think even the most passionate person comes from a good place. But let's just break it down and let's have a look at the science and what the science is saying about the subject, because that's what we do for everything else. I don't go to my, well, you know, I don't go to my mechanic and say, I love my car and I know how to fix it. No, I'm going to trust the expert here uh, to do the right thing. And this is the same. There are, there are people that have decades of experience working in this field. And I think it's really high time that they are respected uh, for all of the hard work that they've done and listened to. Agreed. And also another key point that leads into that, which uh, since you're involved, you didn't plug very nicely, but I will say it's also the uh, the importance for an elephant active for an elephant, a anybody trying to choose an elephant facility that it has been independently audited by yeah. someone from outside, whether it be you guys or whether it be one of the other people yeah. operating to a set of scientific sta standard based on scientific and I science. Think it's also important to break that down because no writing does not mean no cruelty. There are many, many aspects of uh, elephant welfare that we look at at a camp. Riding is simply one aspect. So, you know, is the elephant just kept in a paddock all day? What kind of socialization does the elephant have? What kind of substrate is that elephant walking on for the majority of his day? Is it chained? Uh, so not riding doesn't mean, ta-da, the elephant's living a great life now. Not at all. Let's look at the diet. What kind of um, you know, very diet do you have this, this elephant on? A lot goes into a camp um, accreditation and assessment, not just looking at everything from, from you know, just one perspective. We go into detail uh, from, from everywhere. What contracts are the staff on? Are you giving them a living wage? Are you giving them um, their national entitlements, their holiday pay, things like that? Agreed. 
How about some questions? Do you want me to bring my screen down now or should I keep my slides up? Um, again, up to you. Uh, is there anybody on the Zoom who would like to ask a question? If not, we'll hand it over to Zach and ask him to unmute himself and see if there's anyone on Facebook who'd like to ask. Zach? Ah, here we go. I actually, there's actually no questions on Facebook yet. My goodness. I think, I think everyone may be still digesting. Um, well, <laughs> well, no, I think it was just explained very well. I don't think anyone still said so. <laughs> yeah, I think it was very well explained as well. Thank you, Lingrid. Thanks, Zach. You, Thanks, John. That's, that's, a, that's a first. Do you have any questions yourself, Zach? You usually have a good question. Or Lisa, do you have a question? I see you've unmuted. Oh, you've muted yourself again. Yeah, no, I just, I just wanted to um, thank Ingrid. It was, you know, it's so it's such a clear message. It's so well explained. Um, it's so helpful. Um, for all of us, and it's so frustrating that you know all the all the good sense that you're you're talking um, still you know st still is not accepted by so many people who, as you say, get blinded by emotion or whatever. So there is there is still that frustration. But um, I mean, let's all. I really love the work you're doing, and the more we can get this message out, I think it is bringing some balance to the. The situation especially that we're experiencing here in nepal and, and um uh to a lesser extent in india so we're getting some really good traction um for your kind of attitude um uh, as a result of the um of, of that article and uh so thank you very much for that well, thank you for um, for writing. I don't know if everyone on the forum is familiar, but Lisa is a journalist, and she's re re recently written a really another really good, valuable um, piece about elephants this time in Nepal. So that's on the ACES website and on our Facebook page. If you wanted to check that out as well, there's a link to it there. It's a really complex. Um, complex subject and it's not as black as white as set the elephants free or don't touch the elephant. Uh, because if it were that simple, then the problem would have been solved a long time ago. Um, there's a lot of national laws that won't be changing and there's a lot of livelihoods that are directly associated with this. And now we have the science to show that actually captive elephant management can be done in a really good way. And if we, we need to get out of this, this negative impasse that I mentioned, because it just seems like the tourism industry is just re is really butting heads now um, with elephant owners. And I just don't think it's necessary. I think maybe I'm, I'm too positive perhaps, but I really do see a lot of really, really positive ways and that we can all move forward together. And at the end of the day, we all want the elephants to be cared for. So let's, let's work together and include everyone. I think so. And yes, Lisa's, Lisa, it must be pointed out, is, has come, come to journalism after many, many, many other talents. But um, yes, she also does have a, have a column. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the other key points I think you made that I, I'd just like to, like to focus on a bit um, is the other one that, that, that you made that just getting the, the idea that just getting rid of tourism will get rid of captivity um, in Laos and in Thailand and in all range states, um, apart from, I'm told, India, actually, who, which has on paper a, uh, a mandate to get rid of captivity. Everybody else is still talking about or all, all other governments and government position and in country position is talking about managing a cap captive elephant population. So if there is no tourism, it doesn't mean that elephants will disappear and as you say tourism is by or captive elephants will disappear people will still manage elephants they've been managing elephants for over 4,000 years in these rain states and will continue to do so so tourism is not only as you point out one of the uh, one of the best most elephant friendly things that has gone on uh, that for in those 4,000 years it is also for those of us who care about elephants and those of us in the west who care about elephants a window on the uh, a window on to be able to watch what's going on because tour elephants in captivity or captive elephants will not dis will not disappear will not go away they may disappear from our site if tourism is not included as well so it's a another key point to focus on i think we c yeah it's an evolution and the tourism um the tourism industry has a really really great opportunity to actually really assist and advance this uh, captive elephant population 
not necessarily no hook, you know, or no ride or anything like that. If that's your choice, that's your choice. But we can make it as, as wonderful and special for the elephants as possible. So it's a really exciting time to be involved in this. If you, if you get rid of all of the, the ne negative conversation, they actually think everyone should be really excited to be a part of this and to really help help the locals in this. That's what I firmly believe. Agreed. Um, well, fantastic. Zach, if there's no questions on Facebook, we may... Well um well actually there's an influx of questions right now so better keep your answers straight Over to you. Over to you. <laughs> we have a lot right now um okay so first one is from melanie so uh what do we look for at a tourism camp with elephants that uh like as a tourist what can we look for in an elephant tourism camp that uh we can know that they have passed the standard or score height on the standard Ah, oh, it's, it's, how long have you got, <laughs> Melanie? Um, go to our website, Asian Cup Development Standards, and that will give you a good run through of some of the things that we do look at. Of course, you want to look at how long the elephants are chained for, whether or not they've got marks on them. You want to look at their, their body. You want to look for any stereotypical behavior. Uh, you want to look at where their water is, um, their diet. It's a bit hard because, you know, Visitors to tourist uh, facilities don't get back of house access. So that's going to be a really, a really hard um, thing to judge. But that's why I'm now working for Asian Cap Development Standards because we will have the accreditation badge directly out the front. And you can be assured that they've met really, really difficult international levels of elephant um, welfare. So we've got a, a team of advisors, elephant experts, vets, camp managers who create all of this, um, uh, the criterion for us and is approved by them. And we're constantly maintaining it and monitoring it and checking it and, and asking for their opinion to make sure that everything is done to a really, really high standard. But you can go to our, uh, go to our website and just have a quick look there. Um, okay. That's some of the things there. Thank you. Yeah, I would. I would say I would add to that in 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 balance, but uh, but ex exactly the same answer. I guess is just uh, as a tourist looking to go to an elephant facility, ask to which internationally internationally science based standard they are audited, and if it's ACES, they then even better. Um, but there are a few others out there. But it needs to be it needs to be independently audited and to an internationally recognised science based standard. Yeah. And the second question is about more about the statistics of one of your past researchers. Do you know which age group died most uh, in terms of your mortality? And to my personal interest, uh, if you can also elaborate on the causes, if you know, if you do know. The, the age group of elephants that would, the captive elephants that would die? Yes. Uh, at what point uh, in, their, in their life do you mean? Yeah, like when they die, well, I guess, I guess her question, it was kind. So I guess her question was when they die, what age are they in? That's what I guess. And I also want to ask, like, if you know of the cause of their death. Um, in Laos at this time, it was really difficult to actually really know the cause of death because a lot of, um, you know, necropsies weren't really taken out back then. It would take up to a week to actually get out to the body. So sometimes uh, cause of death was a bit of a guesswork. Uh, sometimes it was snake bites if they were calves. Uh, sometimes it would just, I don't know, that I'm not a vet, so I don't know the technical word, bloating or, or, or some form of, um, you know, gastrointestinal issues there that they would have um, or bleeding and things like that. Of course, poaching was uh, problematic in some areas of Laos back then as well, um, but not as, not as much as, you know, say in Africa, of course, um, I would meet some Mahouts who would hire security guards at nighttime to look over their elephants um, because they just loved their elephants so much. And when they were living and working in these really remote areas, they would know when strangers were around, the villagers would talk and they would know if somebody from out of town would be in the area. So maybe just look out to make sure that your elephants are kept safe. Um, 
but cause of death yeah there, there were a lot of accidents as well I believe but I'm not entirely sure of those exact deaths okay and do you know about the age that they die perhaps uh they had pretty good lives from what I can remember. Um, I'm just trying to think, I don't think we dealt with deaths too much. We more dealt with the living. Um, no, they lived to be a good 60 years old, if I recall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would meet 60 year old men who would, who would have an elephant who they'd grown up with, the elephant, you know, as a child, they were like a brother. Uh, you mentioned higher mortality for male calves. Um, was that a significant factor, or something? As it's kind of asking the question, I guess that's what she's, she's getting at. Um, was that significant, uh, or just something that it wasn't significant compared to the population level? Well, there was a 1.1 sex ratio for in this in this modelling. So of course, you know, depending and like I said, sometimes the Mahout said that there was more males born. Uh, than females. However, we did keep it down to the 1.1 sex ratio uh, just because, yeah, a lot of those males would, you know, word is that they would die um, more so than the females. Okay, but you never... I think most of the time, time it was snake bites. Maybe they're the ones that play with the baby snakes. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, or a lot of things do get attributed to snake bite that, that possibly were other things as well out in, out in the forest. Okay, uh, but it wasn't anything you had direct... Um, direct experience of in your no, in your five no. years there. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for that. And then the next question is from Nureen. So is there any guidelines or SOP like, uh, regarding riding elephant at the moment? So like, is there any documentation, for example, to allow riding with no cruelty? It depends. So I know that there have been some publications that look at survey saddles, because of course, if you are going to wear a howdah or a saddle on an elephant, it has to be conformed in the right way as to not be abrasive or, or cause any issues there. Um, there is uh, at Asian Elephant Captive Standards, we look at the duration of um, work, how long an elephant is made to ride, uh, you know, the breaks in between riding, um, days off, you look at the timetable that the camp has. So, and these have all been made by elephant veterinarians and experts, not just, you know, muddled up on the computer by myself. So I know that some organisations say all riding is bad. Personally, I don't agree with that. I think under the right conditions, and that, that includes the time of day, you know, the heat of the day, there shouldn't be any riding, there should be access to water, there should be shade, there should be all of these different um, perhaps strict, strict guidelines that go along with riding if you're going to do it. But placing a 60 kilogram person uh, on top of a 3000 kilogram elephant, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not that terrible, you know, yeah. And a lot of training can be done. I know they say, well, if the elephant's riding, that's because it's been trained cruelty again. It's not necessary. That may have been the case 30 years ago where elephants were captured from the wild. The majority of these captive elephants, uh, you know, the calves are born into captivity. So they're getting targeted training and verbal command training from essentially the day they're born. I've seen them. It's just like training a puppy dog. You know, you do 10 minutes a day and they learn the verbal commands and they learn exactly what it is that's expected of them. They're not stressed, they're relaxed, they're used to being with people. Fear, fear and uh, violence simply doesn't come into it anymore. And this is one of those old stereotypes that I really think it's about time that it's actually been erased. It's, it just doesn't it just doesn't make sense anymore. It's not logical. No one needs to to use a fear based system with with an animal with with an elephant. Yeah, certainly, I wouldn't say this is it's not it doesn't exist anymore. But I totally sure. agree. It doesn't need to happen, and it, it needs need to be to erased. And it, and it, it, it's yeah, our job it, to erase it, which is what we're doing. Yeah, exactly. It's it's certainly not at any camp where I would recommend, and they should not be in business.
but I guess to go broadly on the question for, for that, so uh, since Zach's is quiet for a second to go broadly on the question. So when it comes to riding and indeed any activity, um, ACES and the other standards who are all, all based on, on guidelines written by, uh, written by international scientists and everything else, it's, it's extremely, they, there's not one or two things that you guys look at. It's extreme and it, it based on the amount of exercise an elephant needs, the amount of time it has with elephants, the social, as you say, all these other things in between, it's not one particular thing, which is again, why independent auditing by someone who can be in a camp behind the scenes uh, for, I mean, in some cases for four days, in your case, I think it's either one or two days as well uh, to see what's actually going on and take a measure of that and then come and say, this is being done correctly or make them and another thing ACES does, I know, uh, make recommendations to help them do it correctly is the, uh, yeah, is exactly. the way to go. It, it is, a, it's a, there's nothing, as with anything in the world, let alone elephant management, there's nothing black or white about it. It's a case by case approach. So, you know, that's every camp is different. Every camp has got strengths and weaknesses. And yeah, riding is something that is complete, you know, it, it takes a long time to, to audit. Zach. Okay, and here's a quick comment from Kind. Like, so she was asking, so she was asking about that because uh, about the death rate because she thinks it would be good to monitor the demographic changes of the elephants if we know at which point the elephants are dying or more inclined to dying. Yeah, I I hundred percent agree and. You know, that's something that the Department of Livestock and Fisheries uh, may actually still be monitoring in Laos. Um, so the government, yeah, Elephant Asia handed over the mobile veterinary unit to the DLF and all of those really experienced um, elephant vet technicians. And they may very well have that information on their database. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But at this point, uh, we didn't. Okay. And then and another question. Sure. was the biggest issue rather than mortality at that point. That would disappear rather than die. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. So another question, I have another question from Jody. So when we are talking about uh, if we want to not encourage the continued capture of elephants, uh, what should we be looking for? Are we looking for standards in the elephant camps? The continued capture of elephants, did you say? Yeah, okay. I'll, I will repeat the question word by word. Uh, so, so standards are what we foreigners lead, need to look for to not encourage continued capture. I think standards are absolutely the thing that you should be looking for. Capture from the wild isn't allowed anywhere, and it's ver it's it's certainly you know again you never talk in absolutes, but it's harder and harder to have a wild elephant. Uh, captured these days. There's microchipping, there's DNA blood passports that are taken now. Um, it's really hard to get something like that passed. Of course, it's not impossible, but I would be very surprised if, it would, if it's worth their time and money capturing uh, elephants these days in Laos. If you could even find an elephant in Laos to capture, you'd be in luck. So I, I really... Uh, for me, I'm confident that capture from the wild isn't a problem anymore. Um, so for me, it's more about how do we actually raise the standards of living now and how do we improve the life and what are we going to do with this core population of elephants now? Because I really do think wild elephant populations seem to be plummeting everywhere. Let's use this captive elephant population to the best of our abilities to act as a genetic safeguard, a genetic reservoir, um, for the entire Asian elephant species. Yes. But Can yes, you... every, you know, I don't like to point out camps um, by names. Everyone's got a different kind of approach to how they are helping elephants. Um, and I think the best way to, to sift through, you know, this people say they're good, that people say they're good, I don't know who to believe. The best way to do that is to look at an accreditation system that they have passed. And that way you know what level that they're on. Do you have something, do you remember, do you know which pointers you look at in ACES? Because I'm sure it's in the standard. I got it, I've read your standard. I can't re remember offhand. I'm sure it's in the standard that they don't have access to uh, 
to wild captured elephants do you know do you know what you look at when you're auditing to make sure that make sure of that we go through every single government license for every single elephant whether or not they own it or even if it's just a, a, an elephant that they rent for a season if they don't have the correct government paperwork and licenses microchip uh, information for each unique elephant on that camp then you won't pass it's mandatory Yep, I think that's as close as, you, as we can get at the moment. And unfortunately, government system, or fortunately, government systems are reliable to lesser or greater extent around the region. But for the most part, if you if you can't trust the government paperwork, then then there's nothing else you can you can do. So I think that's that's the best way to go. Zach. And the. The last question is from Melanie. I hope I get the question right. So she was asking like, so it's, I hope I get, you, I hope I get her question. So is there a, is it, how much of an importance do we put on the Mahouts in Laos? Because you mentioned about Mahouts and the importance in the livelihoods are uh, uh, important contributing factors to elephants as well. Look, I, I, you know, this is something that I, I'm really, really passionate about. What I say doesn't matter. What anyone here says doesn't really matter. The owner of the elephant is the person that makes the decisions. It doesn't matter which country you're in. And I, I remember last, was it last week, um, Michael from the Lao ECC said we were working with an elephant and then the owner decided to go and do something else with the elephant. This is why it's so important to have a really, really good relationship and connection with, with the Mahout, um, because ultimately they are the day-to-day -day defenders and protectors and conservationists for the entire world. So I really do think talking to them, and this is why I did a, a needs assessment and I wanted to understand how they are feeling and what challenges they experience. Because unless we really work with these people and understand these mahouts, how, how are we gonna work with their elephants? Let's hear what they say, let's listen to their struggles and let's see how we can help them. Because once the pressure is taken off them, if they are under so much pressure to work their elephant, that's what they're gonna do. You know, if they have no other way to make money, what do you expect somebody to do if they've got kids and a family that need feeding? Of course, I, I don't blame anyone for needing to work their elephant if they've got a family and there's no safety net in these countries, you know? So let's actually treat these men with some respect and actually, you know, hey, I'd be doing the same as you if I were in your position, let's be honest here. How can we help you? How can we help you help your elephant? And, you know, rather than doing some kind of tops down approach, you will do this and you will do that because that's what we want you to do. It's not gonna work. It hasn't worked to this point. So let's just all collaborate and communicate and move forward that way and, and bring them a hoop with us and treat them with respect. You know, it, it just makes sense to me. I don't know if that answered the question or not. <laughs> Sorry, Melanie. <laughs> I think I can't think of a better note to end on, though. So thank you, thank you very much, Ingrid. Um, I will just thank you for this opportunity, John. I forgot to say "Cop uh, Jai Lai" to you too. And oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so uh, that all that remains for me to do is say uh, thank you very much for joining everybody. Thank you again to Ingrid for for putting on this this brilliant presentation and uh, for for going through your your points of view and um, showing us exactly how the situation was in Laos and giving us a, a very clear way forward in for the future as well. So uh, keep up the good work as it sounds very patronizing. I don't mean to patronize you, but fantastic work you're doing. You know, I strongly support it yourselves and for the sake of balance, anybody who's doing independent auditing to science based, but also thank you very much for your contributions to what is the science based um, knowledge of of elephants in captivity, as well as your viewpoints as well. Um, adding adding a lot to help those of us who are or, or as part of a team of those of us who are who are all working together as you say to try and make life better for, for all Asian elephants including the captive ones so thank you very very much for that um, a couple of plugs to finish thank you very much for the Anantara Golden Triangle for, for hosting me once again I know you don't have much choice but they they do host me and I'm here sitting lovely in their bar overlooking elephants um, grazing in the grassland below um, with Mahouts who are hopefully happy. We do do our best to keep our Mahouts happy too. 
um, and totally agree that we need that's that's one of the key points um, and so yes if anybody is in thailand and would like to uh, come and visit us then please do we're in the far north of thailand and i will say even though you're no longer with ecc if you're in Laos and would love to see some elephants um, elephant conservation center is the only place in Laos to, to visit and go and see these things see elephants as well so i will say that and one final plug uh, this afternoon at 5 p.m thai time we will be doing a lockdown live stream i probably won't do it i think but kun u and either zach or nisa will be with our elephants and show you a little bit about how our elephants and our hoots interact so you get to join them in the grassland it'll be live here on facebook um, we will leave this video live on facebook and i will also put it on youtube so uh, until next week where we're we're having done two weeks in Laos, we're actually going to go to kenya and we'll mention elephants a little bit but we'll also talk about leopards and um, human wildlife conflict in northern kenya uh, with our uh, with our um next elephant professional professional lecture i should call it uh, with mr ambrose who will be talking next week so please do join us then i think it'll be at the 5 p.m time slot so until then thank you very much everybody for joining and we will see you next week or five o'clock this afternoon for those of you who would like to uh, see some elephants rather than just my face and of course the face as well bye thanks